All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we have a little bit of time left still for questions, so maybe uh, if the other speakers wouldn't mind coming up to the front in case uh, anybody's got questions for you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, and uh, AJ over there has got a microphone, so if anybody's got a question, maybe just put up your hand and, and she'll bring the mic over to you. Okay. How's everybody doing? Still holding in there? Been in here for a while. How many people would rather be at Stanley Park than talking about it right now? Have a meeting at Stanley Park. Next time. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, oh, a lot of the reasons why um, mm, mm, people are getting five like this, they say they're exporting jobs. They, they might be easy to defend if the refining jobs took place in mm, mm, BC, but BC has actually fewer refineries than it, than it used to. The, like, we used to have Imperial Oil Company in Port Moody. Why are there fewer refineries in BC than, than was formerly the case? Uh, I mean, the simple answer is money. Uh, there's more money to be made exporting raw oil than there is refining it locally. Um, another part of the answer, though, is that we're dealing with a different kind of oil, uh, and not every refinery can deal with bitumen. So as we switch from um, you know, the more traditional kinds of oil to the kind of oil we're, we're seeing today, the, the diluted bitumen I've been talking about, um, not all the refineries have been able to, to deal with, with that oil. Um, you know, I, I, for one, am not a big fan of the idea of building new refineries. Uh, you know, if you look at places where there's a, a bunch of refineries, like in Louisiana uh, or in you know the uh, Los Angeles area, I mean, uh, neighbors often call those areas uh, Cancer Alley. Uh, you know, because there's you know, Texas. I mean, there's you know in the Gulf Coast area, there's there's a ton of these heavy oil refineries, and and often what you see is clusters of of health conditions around those refineries. I mean, we're talking about toxic materials. Now, there might be an argument to be made that if we're consuming this stuff, perhaps somebody else shouldn't be dealing with the pollution. Um, but, I mean, personally, I'd much rather go down the road of reducing demand than increasing refining. Uh, and we're going to have to do that anyway. So instead of spending our time and energy and money on more refineries, uh, I think we should be spending our energy trying to get off of our addiction to fossil fuels. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a question that you've seen the um, articles by Robin Allen. She's a former economist from CBC. And she wrote The Common Ground and she wrote um, Business in Vancouver about how uneconomical this project really is. And uh, I wonder if you guys, can you can we use Robin Allen and the economy point of view for helping stop this? I know it might not seem like I couldn't possibly have actually cut anything out of that presentation I did, but believe it or not, I have a little section on Robin Allen's work that uh, was left on the cutting room floor earlier today. Um, but yeah, I mean, Robin's work is fantastic. Um, you know, she, I think, is really getting to the heart of this argument that, uh, you know, that it's jobs versus the environment. And she's pointing out that, and you know, and, and many are agreeing with her, like the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, uh, you know, are saying, actually, you know, the tar sands exports are bad for the Canadian economy. Uh, you know, it, it turns us into a resource exporter, some people call it Dutch disease, um, you know, and it actually hurts our manufacturing sector by driving up the value of the Canadian dollar. Uh, you know, and she's also far from a radical, uh, former ICDC CEO. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you're not familiar with Robin Allen's work, please do check it out. Uh, there, there's a lot of useful information in her work. I'm sorry, I'm talking to the microphone. <laughs> and Mark Lee, and Mark Lee, he does a lot of Yes, thank you for mentioning that. And, and Mark Lee from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives uh, through the Climate Justice Project has done some fantastic work on this as well, uh, looking at how many jobs are actually at stake versus how many jobs can be created. Yeah, uh, Sven was talking about people versus money, and uh, I'd just like to ask a question about money. Um, there was a meeting at uh, St. Timothy's Sanderkin Church in uh, Burnaby a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the uh, panel included people from Kinder Morgan and from uh, Chevron. And uh, in passing, the guy from Chevron said, well, we contribute $4 million to the city of Vancouver, the city of Burnaby. And uh, the uh, guy from Kinder Morgan said, well, we contribute $6 million in taxes to the city of Burnaby. And uh, anyway, I, I mentioned that uh, I dug deep and pulled out $500 for Tanker Free BC. <laughs> Which is one reason you have that video tonight. <laughs> so I'd like to know we've got 200 people here, and everybody pulled out $20, it'd be $4,000. So 
So what would Packer Free VC do with $4,000? Believe it or not, Carl actually doesn't work for us. <laughs> well, thanks for that plug, Carl. That was great. Uh, so, some of the projects we're working on, uh, well, of course, we're doing this series of town halls with the Wilderness Committee. We're splitting the cost on all this. And uh, we're going to be hopefully announcing in the next couple of days three more town halls in the Fraser Valley. We're going to be uh, in Abbotsford, Chilliwack, and Langley coming up. Uh, we also, I don't know if I can announce, we're, we're having a, a festival, is that too soon? No? I, Ruben was just giving me the signal. To talk. Oh, okay, so we can announce that on uh, the Labor Day long weekend there is going to be a canoe journey and festival in Cates Park. On the first, uh, canoes from, from nations all around BC are, are going to uh, paddle from uh, West Vancouver to uh, Cates Park, and uh, on the second, there's going to be a concert and festival in the park, and you're all invited. <laughs> and of course, we, we will be uh, producing more videos in the future, and uh, hopefully, this will be a useful tool to help us spread the word on this campaign for all. Of you. Um, I have three questions. Yeah, I have three questions. Um, I live in Burnaby where the spill happened. Uh, what was the chance of an explosion? Um, the, the other, um, the, the people that were impacted, do you know uh, if, they, if, if there's been settlement on insurance and recovering costs and all of that, or is there still litigation? happening and uh, and the oil that's spilled in, in the Burrard Inlet. Um, do, you, do you know the damage there, what the, the estimate is of the damage there? And um, are you still working on recovering from that? And also, um, the right of way is, it has been described by um, Henry Stewart as about 40 lanes um, wide like the size of a, of a NFL football field. So, um, it, it, there, there's, uh, it's going to be going through Burnaby, the residential area, and there's talk about possibility of expropriation. So, um, expropriation, do people get paid off for, for them to, to uh, be able to, to build the pipeline, and how much? <laughs> Is that all, that's all you want to know? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try it real quick, and if anybody wants to help me. Uh, okay, so I'm trying to remember all your questions. Um, first of all, the spill, uh, you know, who was affected and, and how much were they compensated? Really hard to know the answer to that question. Uh, in fact, if there's anybody here who knows somebody who's able to talk about it and who actually was involved in those uh, uh, civil suits with uh, Kinder Morgan, I'd love to talk to them. Um, you know, from our attempts to try to find people who were involved, we, we do know that a number of people have had to sign non-disclosure forms as a result of their uh, civil suits with, with Kinder Morgan. Um, and, I mean, there was a fine levied on Kinder Morgan as well as a number of other companies. And if you look at uh, the City of Burnaby's report, um, where they talk about why they're not supporting the pipeline project, they go into a fair amount of detail about how they think Kinder Morgan bungled uh, you know, this, this process. Uh, in fact, I think there's some, some real similarities between uh, what happened in Kalamazoo and what happened, although on a much smaller scale, and luckily not directly uh, on a waterway uh, in Burnaby. Uh, in terms of what the lasting implications are, uh, you know, it's a good question. I, I'm not a, a remediation specialist, and I haven't been doing sort of data collection for that area, but uh, I'm sure there are people who've been monitoring it, and, you know, we, we definitely need to dig deeper into that. Uh, when we do a town hall meeting like this one in Burnaby, where this will be one of the things that we try to dig deeper into and, and explore. Um, but a, an interesting piece of information about uh, what the end result was of the small amount of the, the oil that actually made its way to water uh, was that the first people who knew where that oil was uh, was the Slave Tooth First Nation elders. Uh, because they knew those waterways and those tidal patterns better than anybody else. They knew that geography and that landscape better than anybody else. And they were actually working very closely with uh, the oil spill response folks, uh, this company Broad Clean and, and you know the others from the city of Burnaby who were involved, and you know everybody else who ended up involved down the road, 
Uh, and you know, they were actually saying, go look over here, go look over there, this is where the oil is going to show up. Uh, and it turned out that they were right, of course. Um, you know, so just goes to show that you know, as, as much as we got all this technology, uh, you, know, you can't replace sort of years and years of experience and understanding. Um, and it just shows how little we really know uh, about our inlet. Uh, and this was a relatively small incident, uh, you know, as far as oil spills go. Uh, but of course, you know, the people who were directly in the vicinity of it were, were pretty heavily impacted. Um, i trying to remember your other questions. Oh, um, an explosion, a jet fuel uh, is, is more of a, an explosion risk. I mean, of course, you know, there's, there's the possibility of explosions in, you know, refineries and, uh, and these kinds of facilities. Um, I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, one of the, the larger concerns, although if it did take place, I mean, like it did at the Cherry Point refinery, you know, it's obviously pretty serious and the people living around the, uh, the facilities, you know, are, you know, it's no small thing for them, that's for sure. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to take the Chevron and others at, at face value when they say that they're doing everything that they can to try to avoid things like that from happening, um, you know, for whatever it's worth. Uh, definitely doing more of it is not the way to reduce the risk. Uh, you know, if we're talking about reducing risk, we need to reduce consumption and we need to not say yes to, to this major exports. Um, and it's also worth noting, though, I mean, as much as we're focused on, on this particular oil project, there's a lot of other dangerous stuff in the inlet, too. Um, and, and you know, as much as I'd like to tell you that if we stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline, that's going to solve all of our problems. There is a lot of other things that we need to be looking at in terms of what's moving through the inlet, uh, and some of it is actually quite dangerous and explosive, unfortunately. Uh, perhaps that's a subject of another conversation. I don't need to be uh, Debbie Downer over here, but uh, or something. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, easy answer to your question is I think we need to take a much closer look at the jet fuel in particular. If you're if you're worried about that. Uh, I'll take the question about expropriation and the pipeline right away. Uh, so what will happen when they get to that phase of the process is they will identify about a 110 meter corridor that runs all the way from Edmonton to Burnaby. Within that corridor, uh, the company will have the power to expropriate private property. Uh, they will, a, a panel of experts will determine what that's worth and, con and people will be compensated for it. Um, but really, I mean, it, it goes through not just Burnaby, it goes through New West, Surrey, Port Moody, Langley, Abbotsford, Chilliwack, Kamloops, and Edmonton. So there are a lot of urban areas that this pipeline that was built in the 50s before a lot of those communities grew are right on, at, on top of. I've visited homes where they, they've literally they've extended their backyard over the pipeline right of way because they don't know it's there. And those people could very easily lose their homes. Hi. Um, great talk. The idea that people who care about the environment, they're already sold on this. I think the real way to change things is to hit them economically. For example, Northern, uh, Northern Gateway. They've got a shell company, limited liability, and their only assets are the pipeline and those two uh, terminals. So if something goes wrong, what are you going to do? Rip it up for them? Helicopters are left pennies on the dollar. Do you know how they're covered if there's something happened in the southern one? And is there any way that you can take some of the economic data that's been uh, created through that ICP economist map and get it to like federal riding levels, especially conservative ridings? Because Harper's got 14 seats keeping them in power, assuming you know, election frauds don't uh, lose that. But to get it uh, at the economic level for people who aren't maybe so interested in the environment, I think that's the real thing. And how could you guys do that sort of like in an open source way to sort of spread the uh, word on that? Well, this is a really good segue to tell you about our next series of reports. Um, there's a, there's a couple of reports that are being worked on right now, um, which, uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, one of them is looking at uh, property values and the impact on property values, uh, both in the directly affected areas and in the city itself. Um, and I don't want to give away any of the details of it, but I think you'll be quite interested to see what, uh, what comes out of that report. Um, there's also a report that's being written uh, by a number of our partner groups, uh, Living Ocean Society, Georgia Strait Alliance and others, um, that's looking at uh, the liability issue in particular. Uh, and looking at some of the costs that we could anticipate uh, and, you know, what kind of liability ex exists or not. Um, I'd love you to want to take a Sure. I just wanted to add to that really quick. When we were bringing 
our motion forward to the park board, there's a there's a chance for public input. And usually we receive people that come either come to the hearing or they send emails to us. And what I, what was striking to me about the comments or the emails that we received um, during the course of that time was they came from all different people in Vancouver, and definitely people that um, wouldn't be environment wouldn't have been their first concern. It would be things like property value, use of the beaches. I think this is an issue that actually brings a lot of Vancouverites together and it's just about communicating that to people and, and helping them understand the risks that were associated with it because it, it will affect us all. So. Uh, you talked a little bit about the issues uh, with Enbridge and how they've protected themselves from liability. I think one of the things that the oil industry learned from the Exxon Valdez disaster is that they don't want to own the boats anymore. So each and every boat that comes through Vancouver Harbor is a, is a different numbered company. And if there was an accident, there's no assets backed up behind those for us to go out for the city or for property owners to go after those companies and, and get anything back from. Pulling out my handy little app to see where the tanker that's in the inlet right now is registered. Who wants to bet for Liberia? <laughs> I'm just killing time while somebody else asks a question. Oh, you got one. Oh, okay. I've been I've been studying the issue of um, the problem with oil companies and pressure worldwide, all the wars, all of that, and I think that. You know, we have to be a bit sympathetic with Mr. Harper and with the Canadian oil company who wants to play on the global market and they tend to not pay attention to the people with homes along there and then, you know, that's, they kind of forget about those things. Hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think that there's going to be some pressure. I mean, there's already been talk about Asian oil prices, how much money they have to spend. Are we going to succumb to that? I mean, what if our prices double? I mean, these are this is bully politics. This is pressure. What about, and here's something, I, I'm a real conspiracist, I guess. There's HARP in Alaska. We've got HARP in uh, Alberta. There's people that are suggesting that they're using that to stir up weather conditions. What if we do get some, I hope not, devastating weather here in BC that is going to cost a lot of money? Do we need that oil money? So, I mean, I, I just think that we just don't know what to be prepared for nowadays anymore. And with that bill, that Trojan horse bill, you know, all those, you know, all of those new things that are being changed, this is all bully politics. So, are we in for the ride? Uh, interesting points to bring up and a good question. Um, I mean, to say one thing, I, I, you know, I think uh, Michael Ignatieff, for what it's worth, I think made one of the more honest comments about why uh, politicians support the oil sands and the expansion of the oil sands. He said it's, uh, it's what gives us power in the world. Um, and I, I think that it's important for us to remember the context in which federal politicians exist. I mean, they you know, are, are looking not just at domestic issues, but international relationships. And uh, especially if you're somebody like Harper, who's quite interested in playing a significant role, and obviously Ignatieff was in international negotiations and international treaties and economic development issues on a global scale, um, you know, having a major resource like the oil sands, it gives you a bargaining chip. Uh, the problem is, is that there's a huge price tag associated with that that we're all paying. Um, you know, and, and in terms of the benefit that you're talking about, in terms of the sort of economic benefits, they're sure not in BC. Uh, I mean, we get zip in terms of royalties from this. We get, you know, uh, a few hundred jobs in construction and about a dozen running a pipeline afterwards. Uh, you know, significantly less than, say, building a Walmart. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of Walmart, but, uh, you know, Walmart doesn't usually spill oil all over the Fraser River. Uh, you know, not yet, anyway. Uh, that wasn't funny, okay, sorry. Uh, thanks. Um, but the, you know, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, I, I think Stephen Harper and, and other politicians who are sort of making these kinds of decisions are, are really on the wrong side of history. Uh, you know, they're looking at uh, you know how to 
you know, they're, they're, they're taking a very old school approach to looking at international relations and they're not looking at the, the new global realities. They're not addressing the single biggest threat facing humanity today. In fact, you know, our Prime Minister has won the Fossil of the Year Award so many times now, I think I might name it after him. So, um, you know, so, uh, I, I mean, I think you're, you're right to sort of look at the framing uh, that our politicians are looking at, but I don't think we have to use it. I think we'd have to try to change it. Uh, before we before we go on to questions, I just want to point out that we're 10 minutes after the time that we were scheduled to end. Uh, I'm happy to stay and keep talking, and I, I don't think the roundhouse is going to get pissed at us if we stay too much longer. So, is there still time for one more question? Uh, yeah. well, it's okay. Uh, how, how do people feel about staying another 10 minutes? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. One thing I want to say here is this. We have to understand that if we fail with this one, the environmental movement is going to take such a hit that it's going, it's going to be very difficult to come back and get back the troops and fight back. So this is a battle, it's a war that we're, that we're fighting right now. And if people don't realize this, then we are in for so much big trouble. My grandkids will pay for this, and I've got five boys, and I want to make sure that their life is going to be at least as good as mine. Uh, one thing I want to say is that we have these conferences, we have people coming to listen to wonderful people like all of you who are talking about things that are so vital for all of us. But we have to get off our ass and do something in the population. We just cannot sit down and go to listen. We need to move. Um, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what plans does the Wilderness Committee, the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, uh, the Suzuki Foundation, all these organizations who are so vital for us, what plans do they have to get the population involved in street action? So, uh, I'll try to take a bite out of that. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'd say, um, I, I can't hear you, sorry, you don't have the microphone. Three weeks ago, I was sitting in my, in my living room and I said, get off your ass and do something. And this is exactly what we did in Mount Pleasant. We organized a small group, simple people, community fighting uh, for fighting the, 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 uh, the pipelines. And we organized, we invited um, a speaker, we got a potluck dinner, and now we want to get in the street at crossroads, stand with signs, and, and get the message out of there, uh, out there, in order to move on and do something practical. Thank you. I, mean, I, uh, I think you sort of answered your own question there, and I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I mean, you know, organizing happens one person at a time. Uh, and what we're hoping comes out of meetings like this is that they're not the end of this conversation, but the beginning. Uh, you know, we're actually hoping that, you know, a group of you who have signed up to the, to the mailing list today we're going to send an email out saying, you know, would you like to hold a, a community meeting, uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood around Stanley Park to start organizing there, or in your community elsewhere if you're not from there. Uh, you know, it, like Sven was saying, I mean, there, you know, it's it's really going to be people power that makes the difference, and you know, it uh, it might not seem like a lot to have a meeting in your kitchen table uh, with a small group of people, but you know, it adds up when everybody's doing it in a whole variety of different places. That's really what leads to change. Um, so, you know, thank you for doing what you're doing in Mount Pleasant and, you know, let us know if there's something that we can support what you're doing. Uh, but the one thing I will say, we're not going to lose this campaign, but, you know, every campaign is worth doing. Even if you don't succeed, it builds the, the capacity of the environment. As much as it can be, you know, disparaging, disheartening, it also, I mean, people increase their ecological literacy, they get to know their neighbors, they get to know their community, and they, and they you know, build strength. And when you win, it sure does have a huge, huge impact. And I've watched this happen over and over again, where you know people win small fights and they take on bigger ones. Um, that's why we need to, to have some small wins and, and then work towards this much bigger thing. I, I just wanted to say that you know we Ben and I are willing to go talk to just about anybody anywhere that wants to hear more about tankers. So you got some friends in your living room. You've got a hundred people in the community center. Doesn't matter. But let us know, and, and we'll be there. Hi. Um, I, I 
feel very much the same as the gentleman that just spoke as about uh, getting the awareness. And um, I've been actually doing petitions on the beaches, and I have to say that 98% of the people I talk to, right away they actually take the petition out of my hand. So um, I'll tell you, if you want to do that, it is so simple. People really want to talk about this issue. Um, but the one thing I want to mention is um, someone mentioned Robin Allen's uh, work. There's something very important that she's brought out. I just think that most people don't know about this. That in 2010, um, our government, the BC government signed a agreement that whatever the National Energy Board decides, they will automatically go along with it. So this is where right now Enbridge is on that list. But there's one way that our BC government can get out of it, and there's a 30-day clause. So Premier Clark can, can actually take that agreement away so that if Enbridge does get approved, and I'm sure Kinder Morgan's proposal is going to be on that list, that we have 30, she has 30 days where she can actually get out of that agreement, that we can have our own BC environmental assessment done. And I urge everyone here to write her a letter Tell your friends to write her a letter, because um, that's the only way that she's going to to listen. The other thing is that we have until August 31st to put in a letter of comment for the Enbridge pipeline. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's basically what I wanted to say. It's more just I want to just share some information with what I have learned. And thank you so much for doing that. I, uh, I think you brought up a really good point, which is that the provincial government actually could, you know, if not slow this down, actually stop it outright. Uh, and I think the next provincial election we've got, you know, we really need all the politicians to be clear about where they stand on these pipelines. Let's see, one or two more questions? Everybody okay? All right. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of comments and one suggestion. But uh, comments, first of all, no one's mentioned the issue of noise pollution underwater. And it doesn't matter if you have a few big tankers or many smaller ones. Uh, one of my research areas underwater sound. And orcas are staying away for a reason. And you can bet your boots that there's a lot of other animals that will respond in smaller ways. Fishes and other marine mammals. So the issue of noise pollution is something people don't understand very well because most people are in underwater. Um, but it's something to think about. A second point is that with increased tanker traffic, there's increased weight and increased disturbance of the intertidal area. It doesn't have to be an oil spill to damage the park, you see. And then finally, my comment is, or suggestion, I guess, is to have somebody brought up the idea of having potluck dinners. And um, something that's worked in the past in things I've been involved in is to have a small dinner, say five or six people, and then have one and discuss the issue or have one of you talk. And then have one of those people who's at the dinner tell them beforehand and be asked of the volunteers, have one other person host another one with five new people. There's a wonderful poem. There's a wonderful poem about it which I don't have the time to mention. <laughs> Their ability to breathe and so on. 
Good questions. Um, so the tankers burn pretty dirty bunker fuel, um, and unfortunately it's uh, not an especially well-regulated area. Uh, our Port Authority has certain rules in terms of what you're allowed to do. Uh, I'm not sure how well those rules are enforced, and definitely when stuff's happening outside of Vancouver waters, it becomes much more complicated to, to regulate and control. Um, there has been a little bit of work done on, on this issue, but de definitely not enough. Um, so I don't know if anybody's had anything they want to add to that, but it's a, it's a, it's a pretty complicated issue, the sort of international shipping regulations, and unfortunately, there's just not nearly enough ability to enforce many of those rules, is my understanding. Um, yeah, I, I, people are often sending me, this is one of the sort of threads, I get a lot of photographs of uh, tankers belching out some pretty nasty stuff, and there's definitely a lot that could be done to, to you know, reduce the, the impact of, uh, you know, by actually regulating the kind of fuels that can be used and, and mandating the cleaner fuel products. It would at least be a step in the right direction. Of course, it's not going to uh, ultimately change whether, I mean, we ultimately need to say no to pipelines and say no to increased tanker traffic, but, but even with the existing tra traffic that we're stuck with, we could be doing a lot better in terms of safety and in terms of public health. Okay, I think we're going to take one more question. I'm Lynn Hadley, and I have a question for Park Spore Chairman. And it is this. Park Spore Chairman said that the Park Board made a motion opposing the pipeline. My question is, has Park Spore appealed to the federal government not to uh, have this pipeline go through BC because the federal government owns parts for it and leases it to uh, Vancouver City. Thank you for your question, Eleanor. Um, we have we've sent a, a letter to not only Kinder Morgan that we want to be we want to participate um, as a a level of government in, the, in their process, but also been very vocal against it uh, better, so. So uh, unfortunately we've run out of time, um, but what, I, uh, what I'm going to say is one last thing. Um, if anybody would like to help us put chairs away, uh, the great folks at the Red House Community Center who have uh, been nice enough to let us go way over time, I'm sure would appreciate some help uh, just kind of clearing up the room. Uh, also, if there's anybody here who's interested in being part of uh, starting this new organization, this new uh, uh, campaign to uh, fight the tankers and protect Stanley Park, uh, maybe we could you know, meet around the front over there uh, and have a little chat about sort of pulling together one of our first meetings. Um, so with all that, I just want to thank you all for being here. Uh, remind you once again that September 1st, uh, come and uh, show your support for the canoe paddle, and then on the 2nd, we're going to have that great concert. Thank you all so much for being here, and thanks to the speakers.